So thank you. Um, it's it's wonderful to be here, and thank you to ESIP for the invitation. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about the OpenAQ story, um, and through that, hopefully, talk about how um, we've been working to to incorporate um, and really connect data with uh, our community and, and users in general, and how it's really fundamental to our mission. And so the, the outline of my talk is pretty simple. Um, we'll begin with air inequality. And if you haven't heard of air inequality, it's because our small community sort of made up the term. Um, but it, it, we'll talk about that and how it really motivated our platform. Uh, and then also talk a little bit about what the platform is and uh, the community and what they're doing with the data that we're aggregating. Um, and then three quick takeaways from, from uh, what we've gathered from this project just over the last uh, year and a half. And so air inequality is simply the unequal access uh, to, of clean air to breathe across the world. Uh, you can see it a few different ways. Um, you can see it uh, if you look at, at the uh, sort of global scale. It's actually the case that one out of every eight deaths in the world is due to air pollution. That's indoor and outdoor air pollution combined. That's more than HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. And this affects uh, largely uh, those living in developing countries, and especially those in China and India. And so a different way, a more um, granular way to look at this is with this graph. So this shows on the y-axis air pollution, smoke and dust annual concentrations, PM 2.5 levels over the course of a year in, given, in these given uh, countries. So this is each dot is a country. And then the x-axis is just GDP per capita. And you can see a pretty clear trend that as you go uh, to lower GDP per capita, you see higher values of PM 2.5, or again, just pollution levels. If you bin these up by region, you see, and probably not super surprisingly, um, a tendency for, for uh, countries in, in Asia and Africa. If you're curious about these outliers, by the way, I don't know if I can get the pointer out there, but those orange, out, oops, those orange outliers um, that are above that, that curve, those are uh, Qatar, Bahrain, and UAE. Um, another way to look at this is, is through uh, research that's been done in various countries and uh, in various cities uh, um, relative to their pollution levels that they experience. So this graph shows on, on the x-axis uh, the number of papers retrieved for various cities uh, in a web of science search for that city's name and, and the term air pollution. So a not super exhaustive uh, uh, examination of how many studies have been published on air pollution for a given city, but it gives you a sense of how many. And un not surprisingly, LA, London, Mexico City, Beijing, you get uh, quite uh, several hundred papers each. And this is from the, the actual search, this is from 2011 uh, data, and, and on the y-axis, you see uh, PM10, or again, smoke and dust concentrations, on the annual average value um, uh, showing for each of those cities. And what's interesting are, is the, those red dot places. Those are from the 2011 WHO PM10 uh, air quality database, uh, the top 10 most PM10 polluted places at that time um, in their database. And if you sum up all of those red dot places, you get that dashed red line. So 41 papers that have been published about those most polluted places. Um, that's five times less than the number of papers published for Houston, Texas. And Houston, Texas has an order of magnitude or greater air quality. So it's stunning. And the, the thing about this is it's not just unfair or unequal, it actually truly affects our, our scientific ability um, to understand the relationship between human health and, and pollution. And so before I show the next slide, I should uh, reinforce the, um, I am an, I'm a physical scientist, I'm an atmospheric scientist, so, so when I look at health um, studies, I have to simplify it quite a bit. And so this is an adaptation of, from uh, looking at uh, uh, the relationship, uh, a simplistic adaptation of looking at the relationship between um, smoke and dust or ambient PM 2.5 levels on, on the x-axis and the relative risk of mortality associated with that um, exposure to, to that air pollution. But very simplified. Um, so we know from studies, large cohort epidemiological studies in the US and the EU, uh, a, a pretty clear relationship between pollution, P2.5 
PM 2.5 levels and relative risk of mortality. Um, it's, it's fairly linear. Now, if you go out to higher levels, levels that billions of people across the world are experiencing, uh, it, you, you, we find that we don't quite understand that relationship as well. We have a sense through proxy studies and through the few studies that have uh, been uh, conducted, um, we, we do have a sense of that relationship that it probably levels out to some degree, but the exact way that it does is not entirely clear because of a lack of those studies. So in the most polluted places in the world where health is likely most affected, we don't have a clear understanding of that relationship. Yet what we do know is that in the U.S., and if we go back to this, in the U.S. and EU, um, where we have that, that uh, nice uh, understanding in, of that relationship, that that's been garnered over um, many different year, many years through many different studies that have relied on open data provided by um, governments. So as it turns out, if you look at the, the most cited large cohort epidemiological studies in the literature, um, seven out of 10 of them relied on open data provided by uh, a government source. And I should emphasize, these aren't, these, they are the most cited, uh, but they're more than that. It's not just uh, research for research's sake. This is, these are studies that have had a huge impact on uh, US, EU, and international uh, uh, standards and guidelines of how, uh, of air pollution policies around the world. Um, so they're much more than just, just a given study. And open data provided by government monitoring really had a huge impact on that. And to give uh, a more, I guess, uh, personal connection to, to why I care about air inequality, um, as Lindsay mentioned, I, I spent a couple years living in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Um, Ulaanbaatar is actually, you might have seen it on that previous slide, uh, it was way up there on, on PM10 or PM2.5 levels. It's a highly polluted place in the winter time. This is a picture in the main square um, on a typical winter day, um, and that isn't fog, that is uh, pollution. And um, it really gave a sense of working there. I was, you know, I was doing postdoc work on um, the a, a rather detailed, a specific aspect of pollution, but. What I tended to think about most of the time was when I was walking from place to place is I can taste the air, yet I can't find uh, an easy place to find air quality data that um, would inform me about what I should do uh, with my day or to anyone in the public um, in this mo one of the most polluted places in the world. Um, and so at the same time, while it was, and actually just to give a sense actually of um, this is current data, so I just pulled off yesterday just to give a sense, so sort of the, the, the quantitative sense of, of that picture. And, uh, this shows a time series of the past week in Ulaanbaatar uh, on the X, the Y is just uh, PM 2.5 levels. Um, you can compare that with Beijing currently, and so you can see it's quite comparable and also currently higher. And if we look at DC right now, those are DC levels, the, the purple level on the bottom. Um, so that gives some sense. This is many, many times above the WHO guidelines or certainly the, the US EPA guidelines for PM 2.5. And actually, it turns out that these levels are comparable to what one would, they're approaching levels that one would experience um, fighting a wildfire, say, in California. And so during this time while I was there, from, from 2011 to 2013, uh, I had also noticed, along with a lot of other people across the world, uh, a, a, a monitor that was set up by the U.S. Embassy in Beijing on their rooftop a few years before that. Uh, it had been it started gaining attention, though, in, in 2011 um, during an apocalypse where uh, the U.S. Embassy had put a PM 2.5 monitor. It was posting data onto Twitter. Um, and it was amazing to me that it, among several other factors, but just this little bit of, of, of data, uh, along with Chinese monitoring as well, created a, a really large conversation that shifted um, the way that PM, or that, that air pollution uh, is measured across Beijing and also China. Um, it created a focus on a more health relevant pollutant uh, from PM10 to PM2.5. It expanded the monitoring that was done both in Beijing and, and across uh, China. And there was greater transparency, a discussion around transparency. Uh, why was Chinese data um, using a, a certain air quality index, and, and why did that vary from the, the U.S.? This is a, a normal thing, but it kind of made the, the, the community and the, the public talk about that difference more. 
Um, and so again, many other things played into this, but I was amazed that this one little monitor could have such an outsized impact um, on the community. And so inspired by that, colleagues at the National University of Mongolia, uh, myself and an American software developer, who's my husband, uh, put up a monitor at the National University of Mongolia. And so we, we put our data out on, on both Facebook and Twitter, um, and also worked with some community groups to, to help um, get the word out about what that data meant, how to interpret it. And again, it really had, <laughs> given, given the size of the project, the cost, um, and also the, uh, uh, the, the fact that it wasn't rocket science to set it up, um, it had an outsized impact on, on, on for what it was. We received uh, national and international media attention. The Mongolian parliament talked to my, my Mongolian colleague and called him in to ask uh, uh, questions and really elevated the role of data in, in science uh, because of this one little monitor that we put out and shared this one little piece of data uh, automatically. And so inspired by that, and over the course of a really a, a, a couple more years and, and various experiences that I've had, kind of put together this open data landscape that actually exists across the world when it comes to real-time government-level data. Um, as it turns out, there's tons of it. Um, so about 70 countries uh, have ground monitoring done by their governments that share data in real time. We estimate there's five to eight million data points per day that are produced across the world, and, and as you'll see, and as you can see here, they're all in disparate formats. They're on websites that um, have different formatting, but typically the same pollutants are measured, uh, that list there. Um, and the other thing besides disparate formats is that they're also, uh, they also, some of them also temporarily exist, so they're not always there. Maybe it's on a website for 15 minutes on a table, that information gets updated, and then it's lost for easy access to, to the public. And so our premise seeing that was, well, geez, there's all this, this, this disparate data, and we know from, from uh, both our personal experiences and, and, and seeing other experiences across the world that there's all these different sectors that could benefit by accessing that data, whether it's the media and a data-driven article, um, public health policy, climate research, uh, low-cost sensors and satellites for, for calibrations, um, certainly public engagement like apps, uh, educational activities, and you could really make a whole, whole list of things. But the missing piece was that there wasn't really this, this transparent um, universal uh, data layer that, that could connect um, all of these different sources of, of government-monitored real-time data. It was the case, though, and it still is the case, that there's several different aggregators out there um, across the world. This is actually one of the best, aqicn.org, um, in terms of geographic scope um, and so it also gives you a sense of where there's gaps actually too in monitoring. Um, but, but the issue is, is that uh, all of these aggregators to date uh, don't provide data in the way um, that we find most uh, useful for connecting uh, that data with all those different users. Uh, because they're typically, they, ha they, they build upon that data in a particular way or particular avenue that, that um, sustains their company or their organization, which makes sense but there wasn't something that uh, provided uh, real-time historical programmatic access um, openly uh, for physical air quality data, not an air quality index. And so that's when we came up with, with OpenAQ. Um, and I should also mention, we did actually, before we started OpenAQ, approach um, various organizations to see if they were interested in doing this. Uh, to date, uh, we couldn't find that. For a long time, we did not want to build something that had already been built, um, just not openly. But it didn't make sense for, for a lot of, uh, for any of the organizations we talked to to do it. So we finally decided we would build um, it ourselves and we called it OpenAQ. And we have three basic tenets to our mission. Uh, one is that we provide real-time and historical data from uh, government and also now research level sources uh, openly and through an open API and that the entire project is open source. Um, and uh, that's so uh, in two parts. One, we do want to just be transparent about how we're going about aggregating this data. Um, the second is this started in, in our living room uh, a few miles south of here, which is two of us. And we knew that's not nearly enough to really um, take this to where it needed to go. And so it was open source partly to get help, which we've gotten from various other people around the world contributing their skills as well. 
and that this is community driven. Um, there's, we'll talk, I'll talk about it more later, but there's really no point in us aggregating this data um, and openly providing it if there isn't a community of users that are interested and invested in, in uh, doing cool stuff and impactful work with that data. So this shows a sense of our coverage. This is from our, our website, just a snapshot of our PM10 coverage. We have uh, seven different pollutants, but um, basically at, to date, we have uh, data that we access from 43 countries. Um, we had about 200,000 data points per day, and we currently have about 35 million data points, um, and it's, it's all open source. Uh, and so what are, are people actually using this data? And the answer is yes, we, we have about half a million requests per month um, this past month uh, to our system. We've seen research organizations from about 700 or so research organizations have uh, visited our, our platform to access data. Um, and uh, we also have a, a pretty active community uh, on our Slack channel. And Slack, if you're not familiar, is just our sort of uh, virtual way of convening our community on a, a free uh, chat service you can think of it as. And so I'm going to get into a lot of the different uses that people uh, across the world are, are, are using, are doing stuff with our data. But first, I just wanted to give a couple fun examples of what uh, things we've noticed uh, lately. And so one cool observation we noticed lately is we were curious uh, at New Year's, would we see um, air quality uh, change when, when fireworks went off? And so we checked out in a few places just for fun. Um, here's, here's a few places. Um, San Antonio apparently had really uh, significant <laughs> fireworks, so they had their monitor very close to the fireworks. Uh, this is PM 2.5 levels, by the way, and, and that peak is at midnight. Um, and also in uh, Chile and also in Norway. And we have uh, a community member who's actually um, going to be presenting some, some work where she makes a visualization of, of fireworks um, across different time zones and sees them go off at New Year's. So that was a fun thing to notice. And another interesting one we saw uh, recently was, you might recall back in November, uh, the fires in Tennessee, in I believe Gatlinburg, and uh, we, a, a community member actually noticed this, uh, that they could see, this is PM 2.5 values over time again, they could see a bump um, 10 miles south uh, at a station, uh, an EPA station, um, due to that fire. And uh, we thought this was pretty interesting to look at, but, but something else that was interesting was then comparing that data um, on our, uh, through our visualization on, um, in Delhi. Uh, and you see that, that bump turn uh, <laughs> fairly small, and you can see that air quality at the station in Delhi um, was lucky to get that low compared to the, that fire that was, uh, the station that was south of that fire in Tennessee. <laughs> So what's our community doing? Um, uh, several different things. So he, here's a few highlights from our research activities. Um, so I'd mentioned we had a lot of different universities and research orgs accessing our, our system. We've also seen um, various organizations use their platform as input into their air quality forecasting models. Um, and, and they've also tested their model output against data access from our system to see how well they're doing. Um, we've also had, unconnected with us, but uh, people have told us, they've, in different organizations, have let us know after the fact that they've uh, submitted proposals to, to NASA and to NSF that have um, used our platform in some sense. And for policy applications, uh, one, one interesting example we noticed, uh, we don't have any, you know, anything to point to at this uh, sort of soon date to say this policy has changed or anything like that. But, but something we've noticed in our system is that um, when the even odd policy, uh, it's a short term policy that was put in place in Delhi last, uh, I believe, April, um, the second time it was implemented. And basically it was uh, you could drive your car if you had an even license plate at certain times and you could uh, drive your car if you had an odd license plate at other times. And so we had noticed that, that we saw a spike in requests for, for Indian data during this period that, that we have a guess was due to, to people trying to check out to see if there was any impact on that policy. And the other uh, potential, well, use case we're already seeing for our data is uh, people doing longer term averages that weren't previously possible uh, to do it as quickly. So the WHO publishes uh, every, every couple years 
uh, an air quality database that, that shows PM 2.5 and PM 10 levels across the world, and it's used for a lot of policy purposes and policy analysis. Um, one thing you'll notice this past year's, and it's, it's, an, uh, it's the most comprehensive ground monitoring um, database you'll find anywhere. But one thing you'll notice when you look at it, so that this past year there was 2,976 cities that were in this database, um, but most of that data, most of that annual average data uh, that, that describes air pollution for that, that year, it actually comes from 2013 and 2014, the vast majority. Only six cities had data from 2015. Um, so having data that's accessed from our system to, to um, give that annual average can be in the year that you're actually uh, publishing or the previous year can be very powerful. And we also know of a group that submitted um, a, propo a proposal to UNICEF uh, that, that uses our system so that they could build, uh, and this is something we get a request for all the time from, from our community to build, uh, is an open source alert system that pushes out air quality alerts uh, via email or text um, so that it's usable in any city and with uh, locally specified air quality uh, levels or, or, or standards and, and, and changeable by, by language. And so in terms of media work that, that we've seen rise from this, a um, few examples. So one is in Ulaanbaatar, uh, a journalist has published a couple articles, one of them comparing uh, Ulaanbaatar air quality to Beijing, which is very common. In many places that Beijing gets a lot of media, international media attention, so people often wonder how their air quality uh, compares to Beijing and it can sort of jolt uh, a given uh, community to, to action. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, in the Times of India, this journalist recently published a graph that shows, compares air quality in Beijing and also Delhi, which it's well appreciated in India that Delhi has high air pollution, but sometimes other cities outside of, uh, besides Delhi, uh, go a little bit under the radar, even extremely large cities like Kolkata. So this journalist I took data from our system and then made a, a comparison between uh, Delhi, Beijing, and Kolkata to draw attention to the fact that, hey, we should also be worried about air quality uh, there as well. Um, and then this is not a journalist. This was someone who uh, is just in our community but she, uh, uses social media to make visualizations that um, often surprise me uh, and a lot of other folks when she shares them that accesses our data, and then um, this compares, for instance, uh, this figure she's made, which you can't really see, but compares air quality in Ulaanbaatar, highly polluted place that's relatively well known uh, amongst international air pollution circles, with a, a small town in Chile, um, and shows that, oh, actually it's quite comparable, the levels that you experience there versus in Ulaanbaatar. Um, and the interesting thing about this, this simple tweet is, someone who lived in this small town saw it on Twitter, uh, tweeted back and was like, hey, I live there, let me tell you about it. And then she ended up interviewing the person and then published a little uh, a thing on our blog about her, about this data, about the visualization, and then about her conversation she had with someone who actually lived there, which was really interesting and cool. So apps and chatbots, um, we've had a, a couple different chatbots. One, the, the first one uh, was from uh, a software developer in Delhi, Amrit Sharma, who's made um, uh, Facebook chatbot, and to be honest, I didn't even know what a chatbot was before he, he built it, um, but he uh, basically made the system where you could say, I live in such and such city, anywhere around the world, and then it'll give you back air quality information, and then he also goes another step and then gives some guidance on what you can do in your community or where you could get um, various uh, uh, things to help mitigate that pollution. And then another group in India that we recently found out about that accesses our system is Hawa Badlo. So they're in, um, uh, awareness campaign for air pollution, and they reach over 14 million people in India, and so they've also built a chatbot with, with our system. And then probably most importantly, uh, in terms of uh, growing our community and getting more people access to, to uh, build on top of it, uh, uh, the platform as well, is the open source work that's come from it. So uh, there's three different projects I wanted to highlight. One is a, a Python package written by uh, a grad student in, in Boston, uh, another one by a uh, statistician in, in Barcelona, Spain, in R, and then a data exploration tool that really inspired a lot of the, the work that we ended up doing on our software developer in, in Ulaanbaatar as well. 
Um, and, and so I've given a couple examples of, of quite a few examples of sort of what our community is doing around that data. But I also want to emphasize that we don't just do, um, we don't just make the data accessible and then stop. We also uh, are a community that has, uh, wants to make a statement on, on as large of a stage as we can about the importance of governments making their data truly open um, and researchers as well. And so uh, recently, last month, uh, 12 of us from 10 countries, which are highlighted there in that picture, uh, came together to write a commentary in the Clean Air Journal. Uh, it's a South African, it's an open access South African journal. Um, and uh, as you saw in those previous uh, maps, there's a lot, there's a huge data dearth in, in most of the, the continent of Africa. Um, and so, so we came together and, and gave not just calling for more open data, but described what does that actually mean and what can we provide as a, as a uh, community to help make that happen for various places. And so this also gets to the point of um, this, the, the, the statement, this commentary, uh, those uh, projects that have come out of it that people have built elsewhere um, will happen to some degree organically, but not to the level that, that we've seen. Um, we feel pretty strongly that it takes um, a, an investment in, your, in a community, an actual act of um, you know, aggregating interested people and giving them a forum to, to collect. Uh, and so we, we do that through a couple different means, one of which is uh, through vir virtual conversations, um, which we have on Slack, that um, interface I'd mentioned earlier, where we have a pretty active community, and that's where we have our most substantive conversations, I would say. And then also we're on Twitter, where people will, will tweet, um, you know, and in the Slack channel, they'll, they'll mention maybe something they created from our, our platform, but also anything in the open air quality space. There, there does seem to be a significant um, there, there's a lack of a place to sort of congregate around uh, air inequality issues uh, in various communities. Uh, and so we can act as a bit of a, a convener of, of those different groups. And then we were also on Medium and of course uh, GitHub. And then the other way that we convene communities is in person as well. Uh, you really can't beat being in person somewhere. Um, and so we do that through workshops. Uh, we've had uh, one in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, since that's where sort of the seed of this idea began, and then also in uh, Delhi, India, this past November. And these workshops are not so much about us uh, instructing or having great solutions to give anyone. It's really about convening different groups locally. Uh, and by different groups, I mean software developers, uh, scientists, journalists, artists, uh, people in policy. Um, people who work at the, the air quality agencies actually running the equipment. Um, and, and the goal of our, our uh, workshops is one, seriously just to convene people and get them talking to each other about how they could be working um, with open data or each other uh, to, to advance air inequality issues in their community. Um, and it's also to uh, see what people build and then take that back to our, our uh, global communities. This whole project started because we saw people reinventing the wheel um, and not getting access to that wheel because uh, of the disparate nature of, of these really valuable data sources. And so we don't want that to happen with, with what uh, local communities are coming up with in terms of building out the platform or, or solutions that they're finding work in their community. And so three quick takeaways uh, of what we've learned so far in our brief time uh, doing this. One clear thing that I think probably everyone in this room uh, agrees with by the nature of what we do, is that data means nothing, mean nothing, and they have no impact without uh, a data, we, data ecosystem or really a community built around them. Um, I think uh, for us, it motivates entirely what we do, and for, for all of us, if you don't have um, a community of people using your data, who, who really cares um, about that data in the first place? And the second thing is that um, it's essential to connect across community silos for, for making progress. Um, we've seen this, you know, one quick example uh, that we've seen in our community say just this week is a, a small example is a journalist in Asia really wanted to make a, a, a data-driven graphic uh, article uh, featuring uh, annual average or I think it was weekly year and monthly averages of pollution in her location and wanted to do analysis and comparison with another place. And she didn't have the skill set to do that. So 
She went onto our Slack channel, said, hey, can anybody help me with this? Someone in Europe said, yeah, I can help you with that. Um, it, it, it's, it, it expanded the fact that she felt comfortable posting that question and then that someone answered um, was really powerful and makes her product better. And it also makes that scientist who helps out um, maybe use their skill set in a way that they might not have uh, initially envisioned. So it seems really powerful. And I would also say for us, as an entity, um, we only exist because of connecting across silos. I myself could not build this platform. I'm not a software developer. Um, I can do very, very little uh, of, the, of the infrastructure behind what we do. Um, that said, uh, my, my co-founder, who is a software developer, um, wouldn't necessarily have had the vision or, or um, implement it the same way if he doesn't have an atmospheric scientist on board either. And so I also think this is going to be an issue that's especially important um, as we're going forward, because I think a lot of the different silos boundaries are, are shifting. So we think of the, the data, data ecosystem community um, in this very uh, you know, broad uh, way of binning up different groups with data producers, technical users, and general users. We see some overlap, but I think um, the air pollution community, but also many other communities, uh, anything involving with personal sensing is going to see that data producer uh, uh, community expand into general users. We're already seeing that. Um, and I think it's going to be especially important for us to uh, make sure that, that, that the general users who are producing data know of, of are connected well with uh, technical users and the uh, more traditional data producers to be able to interpret the data that they have. And the third takeaway is that strong communities don't build themselves. Um, I, I saw this, this is an article that came out in Nature, uh, I think it was a, a commentary uh, last week or this week, and, and it's summed up by this, this caption. It said, researchers must venture beyond their comfort zones to engage with citizens, and they should receive credit for doing so. I totally agree with that. But I would also say it's not nearly enough. Um, that it's really, really valuable to have uh, conveners and connectors in order for uh, this, a data ecosystem to, to exist. And I think, I mean, if you really want to grow a diverse community, um, a strong and sustainable community, you need organizations and people dedicated full time uh, and to see the value in dedicating them full time. Um, uh, to convene and connect and to really to be the glue of a, a data ecosystem. And I, I don't think there's any shortcuts to, to doing that. So those are our, our three takeaways in, in the year and a half that, that we've existed so far. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I can definitely share. Uh, we didn't really get into the technical arch architecture of our platform, um, but I'm happy to answer questions around that um, or, or anything else. I do want to thank um, ESIP for the invitation again, you for your attention, all of our, our organizational partners and sponsors, um, and I always have to thank the entire OpenAQ community for making it worth doing what we do. Thanks, Chris. There is a very interesting uh, presentation talk. Um, it really resonated with me and the, your takeaways, you know, this easy spirit about the community efforts that we have here. So um, we have a, a few minutes for questions. So is there any questions from the audience, please go up to the mic. Hello. Yes. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm Lindsay Barberi again, hello, um, with the University of Vermont. And um, my question is, were you, did you have any other uh, open data communities that you looked to or other organizations that were doing sort of similar things that you modeled off of and, you know, what communities were those is the first question. And then a follow-up, do you have any thoughts about other sort of sectors or other problems that might be able to, you know, that you could see this as being a really good platform or way forward for some of the other science communities to, to think about? It's great questions. And, and the truth is, um, when we first started off, uh, it, it seemed very clear that this, to us at any rate, that, that this platform would be very valuable to have and that it should exist. Um, I didn't know anything, honestly, about open, open uh, science, open data communities when we started off. So it's been a, a definite learning curve. Um, but what's been great is we've attracted, and this is, I think, natural when uh, the first people who are attracted to our platform are other open science, open data, uh, and open source communities, um, and they've been teaching me. 
Um, so we look to uh, our OpenSci, for instance, um, a few other groups, but pr primarily our OpenSci for their model and how they've, they've uh, done things, public labs. Um, and that's all been through other community members saying like, hey, I see you're trying to figure out this thing. Um, this has already been figured out over by this other group. You should really talk to them, uh, which has been, been good. And then in terms of other ways that this can be used, uh, I, I mean, all of this system really does is fetch data, store it, um, and then serve it out quickly. Um, so it could be used for a lot of different things. What we get the most requests for um, and interest in is somehow to apply it to water quality. Um, we, for instance, wouldn't ourselves uh, build a water quality uh, database because we're just not, I don't, I don't feel like we're qualified to do it, but I think there, our system's entirely open and we've talked with um, a couple, uh, primarily individuals at this point who are interested in building something like that. Um, uh, I think there's a, there's a big need in the water quality community for a, a similar effort. Hi, thanks for a great talk. So I'm um, associated with uh, Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis and Lex Berman there has been working at searching for and finding not only government but private sources of weather and air quality data there. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of crowdsourcing issues of, you know, people providing data that maybe is not provided very accurately by the government but has the crowdsourcing issues of quality and anonymity as well. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And you know, to, to start it off with the fact that um, even across the government sources across, uh, around the world, um, there's, not, um, there's not an assurance of data quality. You know, our system, we, we actually don't ensure any data quality because we're simply accessing it from government systems that have varying degrees of how they um, measure their data or varying degrees that we can even know necessarily. Um, so that, that's an issue right there. Um, I think, so for us, and I didn't really talk about sort of the future of our platform, um, we are already, we have a layer that's for research grade level data. Um, we have a placeholder for what we're calling right now other data, which is essentially low cost sensor citizen data, but we're going really slowly to, uh, around that because of, I mean, the issues you mentioned. It's, um, first of all, there's not standards, but there, there's also a lot of open questions. How you display that responsibly? If you have this data that is coming from these different sources, um, how do you convey, with, with, with real questions about low cost sensor accuracy, how do you convey that information on a map that doesn't make it look the same as a government level source um, and is taken with the same sort of weight? Uh, so we're very interested in doing that, but we're proceeding extremely carefully and talking with a lot of different groups on both the, the um, crowdsourcing side of, of data measuring uh, for low cost sensors and also um, on more traditional sides because I think it's going to take talking with both to figure out how to um, manage that appropriately and responsibly. Hi, um, this is Ethan McMahon from EPA. Um, I think this is great stuff and um, I think you're really onto something here, opening kind of a public resource. Um, since you have a lot of government folks in the room here, what do you want to tell us to do that will complement all of this energy that's happening outside of government? So for, for the, the U.S. data, like, so speaking from the, the U.S. data perspective, so there's two perspectives really. Um, the U.S. data has been, I mean, I'm not saying this to pander, like it's been one of the easiest things for us to add, countries for us to add the data because there is, open is not just data on a website on a graph somewhere that has to be scraped. It's truly accessible. Um, so that's been huge for, for us. Um, what we are trying to communicate with other groups that we talk to, other agencies that we talk to across the world, um, in recognition that often bandwidth of, of, uh, in terms of time and uh, human capacity and skill sets um, are, are, and funding primarily, to be honest, are not always there. Um, what exactly, why, why it's not enough to put data just up on, on, on a graph um, elsewise. So I guess that's, that's been our big message to, to various groups. And we actually point to um, uh, the U.S. source of how we get data as one of the, as one of the more robust ways that we, we have to do that. Now, the second part of that is um, it, I don't know, I don't know what leverage or what avenues it makes sense um, for, for U.S. government folks but to, to take those tools, which I already know they do, I mean, having been at the State Department and working with EPA, um, but take those tools and, and, and help 
uh, various other places um, figure out how how you guys are going about the way you're doing. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> Is there any questions from Christer? If not, let's thank her again. Thank you.